Okay, so this is mine. If you're not here for Highway 68, you're in the wrong room. Um, let's just make that clear. My name is Mike DeLapa. I'm the Executive Director of Land Watch Monterey County. I'll tell you about that in a couple minutes, and I'll also introduce my panel. Um, this is an event co-sponsored with TAMSI, our friends at TAMSI, the Transportation Agency of Monterey County. Um, a couple um, logistic, logistical issues. We have bathrooms out there. Um, to the left. I wanted, we didn't expect quite so many people, and I want to thank the people that are helping with the setup. If you get really thirsty, there's some water faucets down into the school. There's a couple down there. But uh, bathrooms, faucets, if you need to leave, um, you know, do so quietly, that would be great. The format tonight is going to be uh, about uh, 15 to 20 minutes for each person, and we'll ask you to hold your questions. And then at the end, we're going to have plenty of time for questions. So as we uh, kind of go along, if there are things you disagree with, just uh, you know, keep them in mind and, and bring them up at the appropriate time. That would be great. It would, um, it would help uh, just keep things moving along. So um, let me uh, see if I can get this to work. So uh, these are the topics tonight, and I'm really happy to have I'll start with Debbie Hale. She's the executive director of TANSI. She's been the executive director since 2006. She started with the organization in 1990. Uh, last year, she was named by the American Public Works Association the, Amer uh, the Transportation Manager of the Year. So she has a lot of great experience. Uh, on her staff, joining us to talk about the scenic corridor is Grant Leonard a transportation planner. We're delighted that you can join us. And finally, with the City of Monterey, Rich Deal, who um, has a long history on transportation issues, engineering issues related to roads. He's going to talk about roundabouts and some of the, um, the issues related to that. So I'm um, really happy that you're all here with us today to, um, you know, to share your feedback and to hear some ideas and, and thoughts. I'll be moderating it, trying to just keep things moving along. If you don't know about Land Watch, we are a nonprofit uh, organization that is involved in public policy related to land use, including transportation. Uh, you may have heard about some of our work on water uh, subdivisions. We've been around since 1997. Uh, we have a professional staff, uh, which includes planners, lawyers, consultants with expertise in various areas. Two of my board members are here, Janet Brennan and Eddie Eddy. Um, and, uh, oh, hey, Daniel, I didn't see you. Welcome. Sorry. Good. Three of my board members here. So, um, we are involved in public policy that is aimed at uh, making our communities better places to live. And one of the ways that we do that is we organize citizens. So, a lot of uh, uh, events like this and various things uh, over the last 20 years that we've gotten involved in. And uh, you can go to our website, and there's a long history of our engagement in public policy issues. We're nonpartisan, we're non-political. So just so that's clear. Um, so let us get started. Um yeah, you're the first up and uh, great. So I'll go ahead and just do a, a brief introduction of who is Fancy and how do we uh, how do we get involved in Highway 68 corridor. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint, but what I do have is copies of our annual report that um, you all received in the mail. That if you didn't save your copy for frequent reference, I have two copies here. Um, I like to say that the transportation agency plans, funds, and delivers regional transportation improvements. And frankly, um, although the planning is fun and interesting, and that's the stage we're at now with the Highway 68 corridor, um, most people don't care until we get to the delivery part of the project and having things up for the public. And that's been the most satisfying thing for us as well. Um, Excuse me, could you pass out some of those for sure? Oh, I would be happy to. Thank here, you. go right ahead. Um, so, but we also spend a lot of time dealing with funding, and I just want to give a big thank you to Landwatch, 
and all of you who voted in favor of Measure X, which is on the November ballot and that provides transportation funding. It'll be at least $600 million over the next 30 years. And the reason I'm running into report is because it kind of goes into the details of Measure X. This is truly a game changer for us because what it does is not only does it give us money that we can spend however we want in terms of the list of projects that you, the community, helped create, and I want you an active partner in that. Do you want more? Um, but it also gives us the ability to use state money that was just approved through um, Senate Bill 1. Oh, and, you got to share. Um, so this is going to help us Sorry. to step up grab. and um, take care of our road issues. It is not going to solve everything. So we're so helpful that we might get a federal infrastructure bill. It'll help us get to the top priority projects and improvements taken care of. 60% um, of the money is going to local road and street improvements. And um, because that was the number one issue that um, voters and everyone said we needed to take care of. And that will be going to the county for the county roads. Uh, they'll be going to the cities um, for their street improvements. The 40% of the money is going to regional projects, and the top project on that list is the Highway 68 corridor between Monterey and Salinas. And fortunately for us, we got a jump start on this project by getting a corridor study grant from Caltrans to start working with the public on setting up a general concept for the corridor based on data and based on public input. So um, with that, I'm just going to hand it over to Grant Leonard and have him talk about the quarter So Absolutely. Well, thank you everybody again for coming out. Feel free to remind me to speak up if I don't. A couple questions. Who's driven Highway 68 before? <laughs> <laughs> That's an easy one. You're all here. Who's been stuck in traffic on 68? <laughs> A safety issue, an accident, a collision on 68, seems like one of them. Okay. Who's happy with Highway 68 as it is and thinks we shouldn't do it again? We do have a couple of them. That's good because in planning, we always do have the option to do nothing. That's, that's where we start when we come up with different concepts to do something. So if we go to the next slide. As Debbie mentioned, this is a Grant funded corridor study from Caltrans. And they began this process of giving us grants to do corridor studies so we can do things like this go out to the community and get your input and not just have Caltrans designing improvements down in San Luis Obispo and then coming up here and doing them without a lot of help out. So this here tonight is one of the main reasons uh, we got the grant. We're going to shape the future of Highway 68 with your input. That's the goal. So this is a master plan for the highway, similar to how the city has a general plan. There are two main parts to it. One part is the transportation component, making it safer for drivers, reducing congestion, uh, reducing emissions from our cars when we're stuck in traffic. And the second part is wildlife connectivity. And that's becoming more and more popular in the state making sure mountain lions and deer and other endangered species can cross the highway because highways tend to serve as a barrier for those animals. <clears throat> so that's part of the study. And then we have the transportation part, which should be a master plan for about 20 years or so. And in the planning world, we come back and we'll do this all again. The next slide. Measure X, Debbie already mentioned it, $50 million dedicated to this section of roadway. When we say this section, we're talking from Blanco Road to Highway 1. And good opportunities to leverage state funds because Senate Bill 1 has special money for counties like ours, has special money for wildlife crossings, and special money for freight corridors. So a lot of good opportunities for us to get more state money to match our local money. Benefit cost analysis. Is everyone familiar with that? Some people kind of know what it is. You can monetize your benefits from a, a road project, so how much time people are saving that has a dollar value, how many accidents are prevented that has a dollar value, um, how much emission is reduced from our cars. All that can be monetized, and that's your benefit, and then you weigh that against the cost of actually building something. So cost of asphalt, concrete, moving dirt, paying an engineer to do it all, and if, 
it all works out, you're getting more benefit than you're spending. Right? And we want to be good stewards of the tax dollars. Next slide. Back in spring of 2016, we started our first round of public outreach. Did anyone participate in that round? One, one or two people. So I'm happy you did. I'm sorry everyone else didn't hear about it at the time. Um, that's just unfortunately how public outreach goes. You don't hear about it, you don't hear about it. But I'm glad you heard about it now. And thank you to Landwatch for helping you promote it. One of the things we did is we collected all of our public comments during that first phase and we put them on a map and we were able to identify where you public felt were areas that were too congested, too many accidents, too many collisions with wildfire. And that informed our technical studies and we were able to compare the two and we found out that our technical analysis is validating what we all know when we drive through. That there are a lot of problems for the highway in terms of congestion and safety and most of the problems start and then trickle out from the intersections. So the red lights are really the, the driving force of most of the problems to the highway. I've got a lot of slides and photos and videos of animals um, that we collected over the last year. We set up 10, set up 10 uh, camera stations along the corridor where we watch deer and bobcats and other animals cross under the highway. And then we also compared that to uh, roadkill data. And Caltrans and the county and the SPCA and Monterey County all collect roadkill data. And that's useful because when you have an area where there's a lot of roadkill, that's a spot, a hot spot, right? And what we found is a lot of these hot spots were right where animals were trying to cross under the road at an existing drain pipe. And they couldn't because it was too small or it was too full of dirt. And so they wanted to go on the road, they couldn't, and then you get a hot spot above the road. So easy win-win there if we can improve that drain pipe, make it big enough for the animals. We don't have to worry about running into an animal. And there's an environmental benefit for you know, more habitat connectivity and more genetic diversity for the species. We have 10 locations for improvements. Some of them are fairly small, just putting up big directional fencing. Some of them are more like this. And this is an example from Colorado, similar highway to Highway 68. Rural, but you have truck traffic, cars, cyclists, and you essentially take an existing drain pipe and you make it bigger and you make it so it looks like that and all the animals can cross over. So that's more expensive than just the fencing, but there are a couple of locations where that would make good sense for us on this floor. The number one hotspot, in case you're wondering, is by the Pasteur um, golf course. And there's a deep ravine on one side, and the pipe at the bottom of that ravine is actually fairly small, and the animals can't cross through it, and that has a lot of uh, road kill right above it. I think that is our number one spot for improvements. Okay, so we did do a lot of study going into this. Um, spent a year doing our existing conditions work and our um, transportation modeling. So we have a computer program, forecast travel, and delay times of 25 years. And we also compared things like level of service for cyclists and pedestrians. Uh, how much delay is on the highway, how safe is it. All of these have been up on our website for the last couple of months, and they're all going to be included in the final report, see shortly. Some of the things that came out of it, not a big surprise, it's a highly unreliable highway. Some days it's really bad, some days it's okay. There are seasonal variations, summer, school's out, school's in. Um, all these things lead to, I think I've got a slide coming up, People have to factor in more time to their commute than they should, just because they don't know if the is being clear. So this is a map of origin and destination. You start in Salinas and where you end up. One thing we found out is a lot of trips start or end on the corridor. So people, they come in from Salinas, but they're not necessarily going to Monterey. They might go to Ryan Ranch, or they might get off at Laurel Springs, or somewhere along the corridor, they drop off. And similarly, a lot of the trips start on the corridor, so the neighbors come and leave and go back. Next slide for 
this is the reverse. As people driving from Monterey to Salinas, it's actually a fairly good split between the two main ways around the fort, which is the engine corridor or 68. So if people are making a decision, gosh, maybe 68's bad today, I'm just going to go engine. Or gosh, I had a bad time on engine last night, I'm going to go 68. It really highlights the need for a full regional perspective to the travel. It's not just 68, it's how 68 operates with the other roads around the fort. This was a slide I talked about on buffer time, time you give yourself because you know it's an unreliable highway. Especially at peaks in the middle of the week, also really bad on Fridays. Weekends, not so much. Um, but the bottom line is theoretically what it should take you to drive the road. The middle line is what we observed in actual delay. And then the orange line on top is how much time people are giving themselves, buffer time. As you see, it's, it's not a very well-functioning highway in the sense of delay and the time people give themselves. So getting back to those intersections. Caltrans has a formula for analyzing intersections. It's called an intersection control evaluation. And it goes back to the benefit cost slide I talked about. You look at all the different ways to improve an intersection, all the benefits, and you weigh it against the cost of putting in a signal or putting in a roundabout. Or if it's a really small intersection, stop sign. But if it's that small, you probably aren't going to do this level of analysis for it. The green dot, which I'm sure most of you may or may not be able to see, I know it's small up there, is a symbol for a roundabout, and the blue dot is a symbol for an improved traffic light. And so, all the intersections we looked at, with exception to one, came up as overwhelmingly performing better as a roundabout than a traffic light. Um, goes back to the things we all know from driving. It's unreliable, there are safety issues with lights, people get air ended more, more likely to have a, a T-bone collision or a head-on with a signal, so all these safety issues go into it. There's more backup and congestion with lights. Um, so all these things for this highway show a real benefit for the whole road if you swap out the lights around them. There are a couple of exceptions there. One is Ragsdale Road. It was recently improved. It's operating very well. It's going to be operating very well in the future. It'll operate even better if there's a roundabout at York. And so doing that improvement uh, delays the need to do anything to Ragsdale. And also Hitchcock signal has... What's the bottom mm -hmm. intersection where it just says 68 corridor? Yeah, that's the right one. Good question. So when you look at the whole corridor and you put it all together, you can do the same thing. So even though there's one that says maybe not a roundabout, if you look at the functionality of the whole 14 mile corridor, it makes a lot of sense to just put them all in, even though that one little intersection, if you were doing that as its own project would. So kind of parsing the details there. If you look at the big picture, roundabouts can make sense. What's intersection four? Intersection four is Ragsdale. Okay. I thought the question was what is the bottom one? The bottom one is the whole floor. It's not one intersection, it's the whole floor. So it's an average. Next slide. So we came up with three general concepts. Um, these were given you at our April board meeting. First option is just to remove the signals at those intersections we just talked about and put in roundabouts. It's the smallest physical footprint, so the least environmental impact, we assume. And its price tag is $48 million. That's its conceptual planning estimate. It would be very safe to bet that the cost is probably going to go up, or that this is a, not an exact number at this point. Next slide. We had a lot of interest in widening. I'll talk about it later, but widening the whole road really isn't feasible. But we did look at sections that could be widened. So by the airport to York Road, so two lanes each direction. 
and then eventually widening from where it is now at Toro Park up to Corral, and then a climbing, sort of a climbing lane, a third lane, just going in the westbound direction up towards the rocks. This has the largest area that would be under new pavements and the largest footprint, and it's also the most expensive, $107 million. Next slide. Third option was to look at improving the signals. I know Rich will talk about this more later, but an adaptive signal system is what this is. An advanced computer system to make all the lights talk to each other. And that way they can predict when the traffic is coming, they can respond better. It improves traffic flow on the highway. Not ideal for a rural two-lane highway. And in addition, the road is very long, and so you can't sync up all the signals. But you could get some benefit out of it, and it's the least expensive because it's $34 million. <coughs> but you do have to improve six of the intersections. You have to make them wider to accommodate the traffic in the future. So next slide. So this is a color chart to just sort of explain <coughs> if you're looking at safety, delay, time savings, impacts to the environment what the operation and maintenance cost is, how much does it cost to take care of it over the next 25 years. Green is good, yellow is okay, red is bad. See a lot of green for option one. A little yellow. Safety and delay is good for the whitening option, but all red after that. And the third option, the signal is just, is red and yellow, it's not a great option except for the cost, it's not very expensive. Next slide. So on May 4th, we started our really our second push on public outreach, which we're doing here now. Public workshop at Ryan Ranch had about 50 people come out. We've been doing community presentations, business organizations, uh, rotary groups for the last two months. Uh, gave an update to our board in June. We also had an online forum where people could go and cast their vote on what they thought about roundups, what they thought about lightning what they thought about the different options. And the most important question that I think you're all wondering, what did people select out of that? And so this shows what would be your first choice out of the options, what would be your second, what would be your third. And the purple line is for roundabout, the first option. The green line is for the second option, roundabouts with lightning. Third is the red line, that's for the signals. And we do have the do nothing option. Most people picked option one. So just the roundabouts without the lighting. And then it sort of splits out to two and three. And most people did not want to do do nothing. That was their last choice. Now, some of the findings that got out of this, the survey had written answers after each question. So you put the box and then you could type in your explanation. A lot of people have experience with, with roundabouts in other states or around California, they go up to ski and they drive through them, they go to Utah and St. George, they love them, they experience them, they're okay, they travel overseas, they're not afraid about roundabouts. They've seen them work. Also, when we were doing the survey, we opened the Holman Highway roundabout, took out the signal. And we started seeing comments come in that I've driven through it, I've seen it work there. I think it could work on 68. Next slide. So some of the other takeaways, a lot of public interest, I think you see that tonight. Um, a lot of support for roundups, I just talked about why. Next slide. A lot of interest in keeping it scenic. This has been a scenic highway since 1968. Second designation in the state, I believe, after Highway 1. Um, a lot of reason people come here, move here, live here, they want to preserve that. They don't want to see it torn up and change in its basic character. A lot of strong opinions about lightning. There are people who said it should have been done 40 years ago, and the sooner you do it, the better. And there are people who say, absolutely never, no way, no how. Not a lot of middle ground on the issue of lightning. And from our results, it was tipping in the no way, no how, as opposed to the, we should have done this years ago. And just, people seem to be tired of the same. Other things that came up did not get selected for detailed analysis, although the corridor bypass, we did do a fairly 
detailed analysis on that. That's the old right of for land that goes on South Fort Ord behind Laguna Seca from Toro Cafe up over to Canyon Del Rey. Um, that land was never actually deeded to Caltrans. It was left as a theoretical planning area for Caltrans. So when the Fort Ord National Monument came in, it shifted from, well, maybe we'll build a road there to we should preserve and protect this land. And when we met with the monument, they said, we really, we will fight you if you want to put the road there. You do not have the support of the monument to build the road. It's also very expensive, somewhere in the range of 300, 400 million. And we have a big new interchange in Canyon Del Rey, big interchange over here, big change in the character of the corridor, a lot of environmental impact. Similar story for the widening. A lot of impacts, a couple of, you made some interchanges, highly unlikely to be able to do all the stoplights, the full widening. Environmental impacts and costs, very expensive, $107 million just to do the segments we talked about, you can imagine the cost of widening the whole thing. <coughs> There's a corral dig here, bypass, those are plan lines from 1977 that were adopted by the board. Essentially it would take a uh, bypass from again around the Toro Cafe, up through what's now the National Monument, down into Corral Beach area intersection. That would be a little no, that's, that Those aren't the flat lines that continue with your presentation. Somewhere in that area. <laughs> <laughs> Not a lot of support from the county in reviving this. Uh, it would be expensive. You have the same encroachment on the Fort Ord National Monument, same environmental concerns. We have a public comment for a modified bypass. If you don't mind, for the point actually might no, have a letter. No, that's fine. Which was to have a small compact interchange for Corral DTR with a frontage road system to connect San Benancio. So looking at it. It, it was to eliminate two signals. Two signals. Looking at that level of impact, it would be expensive to build frontage road, it would be expensive to build an interchange. No, the frontage road is already there. It's already there. And it would largely just improve this section of the road. It wouldn't have a full quarter of that. And then a similar story for the idea of the parkway, where somebody said this great separate everything. Every road gets its own interchange. Very expensive and a lot of environmental impacts. A similar story for all of them. What we get is the same slide again, this time with public input. Uh, favoring the concept one again. So that's our plan. That's our recommended plan is to move with concept one, but with a couple of caveats. Green Ranch is improved development, and as part of its mitigation, it has relocating Torero Drive to New Torero. You're familiar with that. Also, a little bit of widening associated with that, so we need to respect that adopted plan that's in litigation. We never know how a court will decide, but nonetheless, it's an approved plan, so we respect that. Look at, in further detail later on, uh, not in our scope of work right now with this level of design, but consider widening between Corral and San Benancio. The roundabouts would be double lane, so if you have two lanes here, and then you pitch down to one lane, and you widen up to two lanes again, it might work, might make more sense to just have it widen between the two intersections. We'll find out later more analysis. And also, we're going to say they made very clear they wanted to see some improvements to their access. They're not sure what they're going to do. They might look at rerouting their gate to the Rums grade or uh, having most of their access off South Boundary Road, which they already do now for major events. So that's in there just because they want to make sure we work with them as we go forward. So that's just a visual of what it looks like. So I've got this question more than once. Are there other roundabout corridors, sections of roads, you know, roundabouts? So this is a slide from an old, from a consultant from 2011. And they took this map of where there are roundabout corridors across the state. So the country. A lot in Wisconsin, a little bit in Washington, Oregon, Actually, a few in California already. 
New York. Next slide. <coughs> and this is from 2014. This is a map that is showing you because Caltrans actually keeps an inventory of brown dots on the state highway system. And the blue dots, which are kind of white, are um, planned brown dots that have funding dedicated to them. So you see there's a little dot on uh, Monterey Peninsula because when the map was made, Poland Highway was planned to be around about. So now we know that happened. So go back to 2023. Um, purple dots were existing in 2014, and then the green dots were all the planned road dots. So they're not really new to California, and they're making uh, similar brown So where we are, we're a little delayed in releasing the draft plan. We plan to get that out in late July. We're going to release it next week. Uh, we're taking it to the board of our directors at the end of the month to be considered for adoption. But that's not the end of the story. After that, it goes through the whole Caltrans project development process. And then once it's through that, it goes through an environmental review stage. And that's more opportunity for people to provide public comment before anything gets built. And then after that, we need to look at implementing the plan. What gets built when, and uh, what the final plan is for the IOP. So I do have a couple of videos, they're pretty short. So what I think I'd like to do is move to Rich, and then if we have time to come back, this is I want to be respectful of people's time. My name is Rich Dion, the city traffic engineer in Monterey, where it's cooler than it is here. <laughs> um, and uh, Debbie asked me to come to give you kind of a, uh, a non-biased look at what we've done at the Holman Highway Roundabout. I'm the project manager for the Holman Highway Roundabout. Uh, so uh, I'm going to run through um, a presentation that I just gave to the Institute of Transportation Engineers in San Diego. Um, there's a lot of engineers interested in roundabouts. They want to find out how do you build them right, what do you look out for, what are some of the nuances. So we're going to go through some of that. I'm going to try and um, go through a little quicker. And if there's something technical you want to dig into, we can stop and do that. Um, but we'll get started. Let's see if I can do this. There we go. Okay, here's what we did. Um, this is the uh, old signalized intersection of the southbound Highway 1 exit ramp at the top of the page and into the intersection. The box kind of framing the traffic signal that used to be there. And um, down at the bottom, you can see the four beach main gates and that funny little hook that is their entry and exit. And then Holman Highway was basically a two-lane rural highway, which you live with now. And what you're probably going to see is some parallels to what you experience versus what is out there on Holman Highway. Um, this is a special case um, because it's not inside the city of Monterey. It's within Caltrans right-of-way. It lies inside the county. It is the only access way to the regional hospital. It's through an endangered pine forest. It's in the coastal zone. So it has a whole lot more layers than you're going to be facing with the roundabouts you're going to be doing. And which means the cost for yours will be a little bit less. This one total cost ended up a little less than $11 million from beginning to end. Uh, it has some structure and some other things that were there. There it is. Okay. So this is what we experience on a daily basis up on Holman Highway, just like you experience now on Highway 68. And I intentionally drove in at 5 o'clock here just to get a, a sense for what it feels like to do your daily grind. And what I noticed is, as I drove up to each signal before Lorella's grade, um, there was what I call unstable flow. In other words, nobody really knew when the end of the queue was going to show up and you had to hit your brakes pretty hard so you didn't rear end somebody. And the best way to describe this is um, if you've got a glass of water and you fill it over the brim, the surface tension of the water, just kind of hold it in, 
and you add a couple drops and all of a sudden it all just spills over. That's saturated flow when it all spills over. That unstable flow is very unpredictable and it generates a much higher potential for rear end crashes. And I saw lots of skid marks out there. So you deal with something that has daily a lot of anxiety with each individual signal. So it's a little frustrating, I'm guessing, to drive in this port. That's what they experience. This has a one mile <coughs> moving queue that starts down in the Pacific Grove area in the middle of the hill. There is an alternative um, road, so you don't have to take Holman Highway to get out of the so you can take Lighthouse Avenue. <laughs> okay, so before, this is 2005, before we were considering a roundabout, we said, let's do what we do best as traffic engineers and build a big signal. Of course, to move more traffic to a signal, you need more approach lanes and more departure lanes. And this is what you see. You see a whole bunch more departure lanes going out of the forest or from Pacific Road toward um, Highway 1. But we still have that itty bitty two lane bridge that was built in the 50s over Highway 1. Um, the way the intersection was offset and how the ramp was coming in, this configuration ended up not giving us any benefit over the existing signal. But it did cost $25 million. <laughs> and had 25 foot retaining walls and removed almost 700 trees. We thought it was a good deal. So, um, that was 2005. You know, really over the course of this decade, uh, roundabout technology has really evolved and the way roundabouts are put together is geometry based. It's not just let's put a circle down and scribe it inside and outside and then run traffic through it. So this is this is our let's see if I get this to work. Our roundabout alternative. There it is. <laughs> this is our alternative. We've since optimized this and made a few changes, but essentially, um, what we did was we employ a couple of um, sneaky tricks that separate some of the movements from the roundabout <coughs> to make the actual roundabout work better. And the way a roundabout works is. Um, the geometry reduces the speed of traffic entering. So it matches the speed of traffic circulating and exiting. So everybody's driving the same speed as generally slow. You know, very low 20s, upper teens. So at 20 miles an hour, it's pretty easy to merge into traffic in a very short gap and find a place and zip her in. So essentially, instead of um, sharing one small box in the center of a signalized intersection where everybody takes turns like kindergarten. I go, you go. Instead of that, sharing that box. We move all the traffic outside the box and run it around the circle so you can fit more cars in that circulating roadway. Um, this roadway, Holman Highway, only has 28,000 cars a day. Holman Highway, or Highway 68 now has... 25 to 30? 30,000, 26. So very similar volume. 36. 36? Is it 36? 36. Yeah. 36. Lighthouse Avenue has 46,000 cars. Lighthouse Curve has 56,000 cars. Lighthouse Avenue carries 46,000 cars a day. And Lighthouse Curve carries 56,000. So, here we are at 26 to 28,000, very similar volumes. Um, and the idea of a roundabout is we create splitter islands that slow down the approaching traffic in a way where you're not abruptly coming up to a stop or yield condition, just like you do with a traffic signal. You know, a light's green, all of a sudden yellow. You know, you're in your little lane and you hit your brakes. This has much more sweeping um, entry angles and it, it sets up the car so that when they enter, they're pointed correctly. <coughs> you yield and look left and then you go right in. Find your gap and go right in. 
It's a single lane hybrid because the eastbound movement, um, I'm going to go back, the eastbound movement, sorry, one more, the eastbound movement does have two lanes through, and you can see it in the eastbound direction. So the ones on Holman Highway, the one on 68, they're being proposed are two lanes on is that correct? So how are they different? Uh, they're, they're different because the through movement in both directions on Highway 68 is higher and it's peaking. This specific case, I've got a one lane bridge coming over Highway 1. So adding a second lane in the westbound direction doesn't give me any benefit. However, we did design this so that when we do replace the bridge, just a few short years, um, we can expand this to a full two lane highway. So, what do I get with that one lane exit ramp from Highway 1 coming up from Carmel, going over the ramp and across the bridge? I get a little bit more queuing, right? It just kind of goes back and it dissipates over time. I don't have nearly the queuing I used to have with the signal, especially in the westbound direction. I had this short little, it was almost cute, left turn pocket. Because it fit in between the bridge deck and the signals, little itty bitty, you know, two car. And those cars would have to zip into their left turn with their little left turn signal. And of course, you got the two guys behind you on the yellow and one behind him on the red. And that's how people would get into Pebble Beach from that direction. In this direction, they go across the bridge, look left, right in, and they zip around. Once you're in the roundabout, you have the right of way. And so you don't have to compete with other traffic. You're only competing with the traffic that's coming in from the left. So this essentially cleared up a queuing problem that the Pebble Beach folks had on their entry gate, which is really good. Yes, sir. But the speed limit in that area is probably only about 35 miles an hour, unlike Highway 68, where everybody's ripping along at 55. And I understand the whole neck and down thing, because I run to Marina every day, and I run that one at Beach and... Mm -hmm and Del Monte, but I can see where this would work because it's you're, they're already slow. Yeah, they're 40 miles an hour. You're right. It, it, it's already slow. So I, that's one question that nobody's addressed the speed, and that's what I'm hoping so gets kind of addressed. Hold that for the end. I'd like to get through his presentation. Yeah, yeah, no, no problem. Back to that. I, I, will hit, I will hit a little bit on speed that makes a big difference in the operation that we're on. Okay. This is during our planning process, this is what we were estimating. Um, during the PMP hour, um, with the roundabout, which is um, the blue and the orange, we had a lot less delay and a lot less queuing than with the green, which is the traffic signal. And we're striping our roundabout um, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday night. So it will be fully open for car week. Drive through, see what you think, especially if you've been through there before and had to endure some of the queuing on the southbound exit ramp or coming up from some grove in that long queue that you were, you were frustrated, you peel off on the sky and force and drive through the night neighborhood and then I get a phone call. <laughs> okay, so this is a simulation, this is our simulation that we did for our roundabout. And, um, You'll see all the cars doing their thing. What I want you to look at is over here to the left, there's little things sticking up. That's the Carmel Hills Professional Center driveway. And that's been a real uh, prickly little thing because with the traffic signal, the only way you could make a left out was with a courtesy gap. Some really nice lady who had a very compassionate car and three cats at home would stop and let me make a left turn out of it. In this case, the traffic is more free flow. That, so that left turn in is a much more difficult. But you'll see how this thing runs. Um, specifically, when you look at the queuing coming up from Civic Row, which is off to the left, off the screen, and going into the roundabout. That's where we have the two lane section. So let's see if I can just tap that. No animation. And I'm, I apologize, this is a bigger, it's hard to see.
it was great. <laughs> <laughs>
if you want to go to Highway 1 South or Pebble Beach, you get in the right lane and you turn right. And then there's another sign that does the same exact thing. Um, I do want to jump to the speed issue. Where are those gentlemen? Yeah, way back. Okay. Existing southbound on ramp. So if you're standing in the roundabout or at the intersection, that's the view you have looking south toward Carmel to the on ramp. Cars coming toward you are came out of Pebble Beach and they're heading up into the intersection. So what we have here is this very short decision time because the lane choice is just immediate. And there's a lot of pavement and it's pretty much a straight shot on the Highway 1 south. It's a gentle downhill so your car naturally wants to run a little faster. So we measure the speed um, crossing that stop control exit out of Pebble Beach. It was 45 miles an hour. Some folks with nicer cars can get up a little faster, but generally it was about 45 miles an hour. On top of that, Okay, I'm going back. I'll just describe it. So, on top of that, um, the left turn out of Hell Beach was very slight and it was very gentle, and so the amount of time the driver was spending inside that conflict zone of that 45 miles was really long. And because it was uphill, it was slow. So we did get crashes that involved a downhill, higher speed traffic movement versus a left turn coming out. And the left turn crashes usually hurt because the driver's right there where the impact is. It's uncomfortable. So what we did was we put in that teardrop. It made the crossing more of a right angle. It was shorter, only a 12-foot crossing, 12 to 14 feet. And the driver has a very good view of what the driver, the opposing driver is doing as we separated the movement farther and we made him do this big S shape turn that drops him to about 20 miles an hour so it's a lot easier to gauge time, distance and execute a good process. Okay, this is an intersection in Love of Loveland, Colorado. This is a roundabout and we have a merge. We go from eastbound two lanes on Holman Highway through the roundabout, and then in short distance, 130 feet, that traffic has to merge back to one lane to go over that itty bitty bridge in 1958. This is the same distance, the same merge condition, and very close to the same volume of traffic that we have. The difference is they're going under a bridge instead of over a bridge, it's still a one lane. So hopefully this video works. Let's see if that works. I hope this works. No, we'll plug this thing in. Because this is really important. You're going to have roundabouts where you're going two lanes through and then dropping to one lane. And you need to know, is it going to work or is it not going to work? Is this merge going to be really frustrating? Is it going to cause a backup that goes through the roundabout? Mm -hmm. Let's this thing This was really important for me because I wasn't willing to accept this really short merge um, until I knew it was going to work really well. Um, by the way, just so you know, a merge for a state highway at 55 miles an hour is 600 feet. So this is much shorter. Well, the speeds are 20. They're not 55. They're not 55 when we go to the ground. We drop the approach speed to the right speed. Everybody's going slow. Predictable, you look left, the guy coming from the left is going 20, you enter to the right, you go around, you exit at 20, everybody's going 20. Well, he's loving that. Let's take questions because I've covered a lot of stuff. Anybody? Our, our question is for this, for the roundabout. There. Yes, for how does a roundabout work? That's really what I'm trying to get at. How does how's a roundabout work? And I want to like increase your understanding of what a roundabout is. So, so uh, as I understand the concept of a roundabout, uh, you need to have a gap if you're trying to enter the roundabout. You need to have a gap in cars. If you have a steady stream of cars, as there are often on 68 at the intersection, and someone is coming from a side street, 
it seems to me they're not going to be able to get into the roundabout without a gap in the car. So right. The, the side streets, such as Pasadena, you would sit there at um, 9 o'clock, 8 o'clock in the morning looking for a gap in the car and you'd never find it. Yes. That's a very, very, very common question. Uh, especially when you're used to driving through the very same intersection with a traffic signal, what does the traffic signal do? When the light goes red, it compresses traffic into a pl platoon. When it goes green, it discharges the platoon all the way through. There are no gaps while that platoon is discharging. As traffic comes up from the back, as the light just turns green, the queue builds longer and longer. It's still discharging. There's still cars added to the queue. A lot of times, especially here on these intersections, the light turns red again, and the cars still haven't dissipated. That's the feeling you get from a traffic signal, because you have to share that box in the middle. With a roundabout, the traffic is going to find a more free flow state. Yes, there will be some queuing during your peak periods, but generally, it's spread out a little bit more. The arrivals are slightly more random, not so compressed. So you will find gaps. Now, does that mean you will always find a gap within two or three cars? Maybe not. What if you don't find it in 10 cars? OK, you don't find it in 10 cars. How many cars do you have to wait for that signal now? Two, three so cycles. If you're wrong in your assumption during uh, peak hours, there will be gaps. That's uh, yeah, kind of a... Uh, well, look at the model. Yeah. Look at the model. The modeling is really good at showing how the arrival kind of shows up. Because when you get a left turn around the roundabout, that major through movement has to yield to traffic inside the roundabout. That yield gives you an opportunity for an entry on the side street. And I wish our roundabout model, because ours has much more compressed volumes, and you would see how folks enter. As a matter of fact, I would really encourage you to go drive the Highway 68 roundabout before you make up your mind about whether Rich is full of crap or not. And drive it. Drive it on car week, where there's way more volume than we get during the day. Drive through and see how it runs. See if you get a gap from the side street. See what it feels like to accept that shorter, slower gap versus waiting for a long gap and a higher speed road. Drive it and, and experience it. So what I'd like to do, I think you guys have done a great job with the presentations. Why don't we just open it up to questions now? Thank you. Yeah, because I think we've, we've all been very patient. So I will moderate, just raise your hand if you're the first question. I have a few part questions. Okay. Are they going to allow 18 wheelers and big trucks on 68? Yes. Okay. So, every morning, I sit down at the town council meeting at Mario's gas station, and we watch the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> very familiar with the crowd on 68 and for all the terrible. If you've got an 18 wheeler who is just come through Lorella's gray roundabout and he's trying to pick up speed to go up the hill and he's building up a long queue of cars and trucks behind him and he gets down and he's still so got vehicles in front of him so as he's approaching Corrales Sierra, he's slowing down at about 20 miles an hour to navigate that queue or the roundabout okay and it's so you've got the behind him upward of bumper traffic. Now, when school's in session in the early morning, there's there could be 25, 30 cars lined up on corral waiting to get on 68. Where are they going to find the gaps to allow them to get into the uh, roundabout to continue east on 68? I would let me. Sorry. Okay. So. You've got a couple of um, couple of things that you're working with. 
The first one is, can you get a gap into the round? And that's the first view, the same view you have. The second one is, do we have enough capacity to accommodate that flow downstream? And that's what makes this highway hard to work. Because you've got a two-lane road, the pipe is this big. That's it. The only way to get more capacity is to make the pipe bigger. The only way to make the pipe bigger is to get a lot more money. That's Debbie's job. But <laughs> the roundabout will essentially create more capacity inside the intersection, so there will be more opportunities to get through it. Downstream, it's going to discharge a certain amount of traffic into the facility. Just like right now, it's metered with traffic signal, right? You get in that first signal, and it queues really long, and then it turns green, and you discharge a certain amount of traffic downstream, and then the signals basically try and accommodate it as you go through. All this is going to do is make the intersections work better. It won't solve the capacity shortage of the whole facility. Will it drive better? Yeah, drive better. Will it be a safer? Immeasurably safer. Will it feel, feel less um, frustrating? Will you lower your anxi anxiety level? Yes, you will. You'll have more predictable flow. You won't have that really frustrating, wow, all of a sudden it turned green or turned red and bam, I gotta hit my brakes. It's gonna be slower, it's gonna drive slower, it will move traffic through. You won't get any more capacity out of throughput out of the whole facility though. Does that make sense? There's a bus stop right on the north uh, uh, side of 68 for Westbound. Are they going to eliminate the bus stop? I have one on mine, I didn't want to name it. Okay, so how would people... So, so what I'd like to do, just to be respectful, because there's a lot of questions, if we can come back and get yours, they, they've also offered to talk afterwards, but I've seen lots of hands go up, so I, I want to give other people just a chance. Go for this. Okay, uh, yes, sir. You. Yeah, um, the gentleman in the room. Sorry, forget your name. Um, Highway 68 was built to handle X amount of traffic. Right now it's handling what, 50% more than what it was built for, or something like that? Something like that. How are roundabouts going to improve the capacity of that road to handle the, the traffic that it's handling now, and then in the future, by the time, if you do roundabouts at all the intersections you're talking about, which is going to be, what, 10, 20 years? So something like that. Great questions there. Um, <laughs> first of all, yes, it is handling more traffic than it was designed to hold. Uh, second question, how does it improve capacity or flow? And this gets actually back to your question about queues. So how do you get those 30 cars that are stacked up waiting on? What we're seeing with the Holman Highway Project and what they sell all, all across the country on that map and corridor they showed you is that you don't get the same level of backup to begin with. So you don't get those long plumes that lead to the delays. And that is what helps the flow. So yes, it's taking more cars than it was designed to. Most of that's during the periods. Sometimes the issue is not congestion, it's speed, because there are so few cars, people are speeding. So what we're looking at is optimizing the flow during those peak periods. And traffic lights stop traffic. Roundabouts go. That's the basic concept of how we improve the flow. Okay, uh, question over there. Yeah, I have a question. It's on your list. Reverse direction. I don't think I can do that. Reverse lane. That? Yeah, so yeah. a reverse direction lane is they have it on Golden Gate Bridge. They have it on the East Coast. They have it in Hawaii when I was on my honeymoon. If you have a lot of AM traffic going this way, the PM and going this way, you can build just one third lane in the middle, and the day you flip it over, and then in the morning you flip it back. That requires a lot of directional split, 70% that way in the morning, 70% that way in the evening. We're not there for the highway. It's closer to 45, 55. Uh, it seems worse, but from the traffic count from here, that's what it looks like. And so it wasn't justifiable. It didn't meet the cost benefit factors either. So it just didn't pencil out, even though it was tossed out. Okay, push it over here. Yes, sir. 
Yeah. Um, the city just drove east from Monterey at 5 o'clock. Have any of the four of you driven from Salinas to Monterey starting at 7.30 in the morning on the yes. school day? Yes. What, what can you do about the Torero? Can you block off Torero? Great question. And we've been to the Toro Park Homeowners Estates meeting several times to talk about this. A lot of this dovetails with what's already planned in Torino Ranch with the new Torero intersection. So what happens now is the highway pinches down, and then there's a little road, Torero Drive, that comes on right after the pinch down. So when it backs up, um, apparently spirited people get off, speed through the neighborhood, blow past the school, make a left, and sneak on when Rich's you know, her grandmother with her cats is polite enough to let them in. And so that turns Highway 68 into essentially a stop sign, which backs it up even more, which encourages more people to get out and get through. What's planned with Bray uh, Ranch, and what's also included in this plan, is the relocation of the intersection to New Terrera. So what that does is, it, especially with the lightning, it takes away the pinch down. And so there's no incentive to get off and go through the neighborhood. And relocating it further down also helps out, um, takes away the incentive to cut through. And with the roundabout in place, instead of the stop sign, you won't have the meter in it. Yes, go, no, don't go. So that's how that area is being How many years is that? So for funding, that was another part of the other gentleman's question. We have a dedicated funding source in Measure X. It's a 30-year sales tax. The board of directors is going to decide a couple of things. Do we bond against the value of the tax so we get all the money up front and we just pay interest payments for the next 20 years? Do we prioritize certain projects first and then we do them in the first five or 10 years? Highway 68 is the number one priority in the directs, so it's probably going to be moving on the faster side of things. When we get into building it, we'll look at phasing. Do we do all of it once? Do we do it in two or three phases? And which section of the highway gets improved first? All that's going to be worked out a little later. But it's not, you're going to be alive to see something happen. Yes, uh, could Rich respond to uh, bicycle safety, uh, emergency vehicle response? And uh, also the shopping center that's going in and crowding Tierra. No, it's not. Uh, whether it goes in or not, you know, I'd like to see it built before I die. But um, what do you do? Do you buy the property owner out? How will you handle the shopping center issue? So there's three questions there. Good questions. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Deal with the county traffic in Monterey County. So we missed all this stuff. Okay. Bicycles and emergency vehicles. This was a huge issue for um, on the highway roundabout because we are the front door to uh, Chomp. Their only access is on Holman Highway, just an intersection away. And when we built it, we conditioned the contract that we had to leave room so that we could get any emergency vehicle through the construction site 24-7. On top of that, we had CHP presence whenever we closed a ramp so that if we had a doctor or a patient that came in a private vehicle, they could be escorted through the construction site as well. We took care of that and always maintained emergency vehicle access. And I don't think we had a single ramp was our average man. It's really good. Bicycles. Um, the Holman Highway Roundabout is on the um, Monterey Bay Coastal Trail route. So we get a lot of um, long distance bike riders going through there. Um, <clears throat> the roundabout is designed so that as a bike rider, you can actually take a lane, command that space, and execute that movement well. For more timid riders, um, or those who are not familiar with the area, we created, instead of a five foot sidewalk, we created an eight foot mixed use path, so you can ride on the sidewalk around the roundabout, use the crosswalks that are in advance of the yield control, one lane at a time, work your way across and go down. Of course, they're getting on Highway 1 going south, so to me, I mean, I think they're always going to ride through the roundabout instead of doing the sidewalks. But long term, 
Um, we also planned for a uh, bike tunnel underneath the bridge over Highway 1 when we widen it to four lanes. So that would happen when we do that work. So the bikes were very consciously dealt with. Um, the pedestrians have found walking through the uh, roundabout very, very simple. And it's not even striped yet. So when it gets striped, you'll have the crosswalks, the pedestrian signs, all that stuff. Um, what we did not want to do was um, create a crossing condition where we had to control traffic across the crosswalk. In other words, we didn't want to, have to stop stop cars so that people could walk across. People would find a gap just like driving on the side streets, and it works. And so the second part of the question, uh, which is the shopping center. Kind of similar situation to Freedy Ranch, and they're both in litigation, they're both approved. Uh, what we'll do is, when it comes time to make an improvement at Corral, we'll talk to the property owner and the developer, and this is what we're doing with Laguna Seca, we'll work with them on any access issues they have for it, and uh, we'll wait and see what the courts decide. It's somewhat of a question mark. Was that, was that, that included in the cost estimate? <coughs> I know. The uh, shopping center? The I mean, cost estimate is very high level, it's conceptual, so you look at a generalized okay. blueprint of the area and then ballpark figures for what it costs to build for asphalt and concrete, <coughs> dirt moving, potential land you need right away. So it's rather high level. Cost and mm -hmm. just to build on, since I'm the money person, what, what is built into the money and the things is that if you develop in Monterey County, then you will pay the TAMC Regional Traffic Impact Fee, and Highway 60 is one of the projects in that corridor. So they eventually pull building permits on that project, will be paying the TAMC Traffic Impact Fee, and that money then can be used to help fund some of these improvements. Jim? Good. Um, the, I, I've used the roundabout, and Good. going from Carmel into Pacific Grove is fabulous, so I have not have to stop once, and I've done it any number of times. But today, the backup on 68 going uh, south was uh, significant. Is that temporary, or? Yes, we have two lanes closed. OK. <laughs> I can just so, Yeah, so all the traffic was diverted to the right turn lane okay. in order to end the round. OK, gentlemen, um, we all kind of know we've been driving this stretch of the road for some time. We have an idea right now what it currently takes to get from Salinas to Monterey and 68. What do you estimate? And I don't know what you think it is, but I'm just curious as to what you think it is now and what it would be with all these in place. Good question. So let me have a slide for that. We didn't include it tonight. It goes back to the travel demand model I mentioned, so forecasting out 25 years. So we don't just compare what it's like now, we compare what it's going to be in 2035, and it's going to be worse in 2035, assuming a couple of things, that all the growth that's currently planned in Monterey County happens, so that's how you base your model, you take all the estimated homes and estimated jobs, and that's your future number of traffic you have. So it assumes that, also assumes a number of improvements uh, that are planned by TAMC and other agencies like the Port Order Use Authority or City of Monterey. And that's how you get your future measure of delay. And so in the future, it's going to be considerably worse, even though it's only adding about 10% more traffic because we're at or just past the tipping point of the functionality of the road. So under the improvements, we're going to be holding very close to what it is now. Not a lot better in terms of big picture cumulative delay. So when we say that, we add up all the cars for all the day and how much time we delay, which is an engineering perspective on the road. And then we average that out with an average delay. And that's how we do our measurements for whether it's worthwhile to do. And that's monetized too when you add that to the safety benefits. And you're looking at maybe somewhere in the range of 200 million benefits from the improvements. So we're spending $50 million, you're getting $200 million back. So it's a good investment. Uh, but there's still going to be issues with congestion. 
That's why the county and the Ford Order Reuse Authority in Kansas here are looking into widening the other way around. So Amgen Reservation Road and Davis Road. And some of that's also included in Measure X, so we know there's going to be a very attractive four-lane alternative to Highway 68. Eastside Parkway is also proposed to be developed. That should help out provided it's built. So we have, have a, we have a saying in uh, traffic engineering that no individual raindrop on the user is responsible for the flood. <laughs> <laughs> So the gentleman in New York. Yeah, you, you probably can't answer this black or white, but if instantly you had approval tonight, something you had to run, and you put those six or seven roundabouts on the corridor, I forget the number of them. What sort of impact in the interim can you anticipate while the construction is going on? Yeah. Uh, difficult to answer, but give us some something, maybe a, a benchmark with what's going on at Holman. So uh, we had an extremely robust staging program, eight different stages. Um, and within those stages, we had sub-stages, ABC for different things. And we made conscious choices based on what was more important at the time. So is it more important to endure some longer traffic delays over the course of three weeks, or pay the overtime and close a ramp for a whole weekend and get it done in a weekend. And we made those judgments um, as we went along. We also had to avoid a very long list of special events on the peninsula, which are extremely challenging, which is why we are getting the roundabout fully open before Car Week, because as you know, you know, there's more Ferraris and Toyotas on the peninsula than it is. So the staging is a very critical piece. Uh, it's it's challenging because there's a lot of stuff in roadway construction that is not immediately knowable. Buried stuff, utilities you didn't know were there, waiting on utilities to relocate. Um, there's <coughs> environmental impacts, you know, there's just a lot of unknowns. Can you extrapolate from the whole experience to what it might be on 68? Well, I can tell you from the whole experience, we were highly successful. We stayed within our one year time frame to get the thing built up. And we stayed within budget. So we were very, very successful. But we were also very, very deliberate in our outreach. So we told everybody, and we had text messages going out. Grant did a weekly email to everybody. We told everybody in the entire peninsula every week what was going to happen. And when we had a major thing that was coming, a ramp closure, whatever. We told folks through um, hospitality associations and our group of um, uh, public relations managers for Pebble Beach, uh, City of Monterey, the Aquarium, a bunch of them. We told them, hey look, tell your folks this is coming. We worked with MST and MST gave discount bus passes for folks who just didn't really need to take their car. That was very successful. Um, we did um, rideshare programs, we did discount parking, we did satellite parking at Waterloo so College. We used every tool we possibly could to get the word out that it's going to be difficult from whatever that stage was. And you know, when people knew what was coming, they were able to consciously <coughs> adjust, and it worked. We had very, very, very few complaints. And this is probably construction where it's like you only get complaints. But it was highly successful. And yeah. also, this, I'll extrapolate a couple of details. We did a lot of night work to avoid traffic. When we had to do a major closure, we tried to compress it as much as we could. So we did a, a ramp closure, southbound off ramp, most traffic on any of the ramps. We did that over two days on Veterans Day weekend. We looked at all those chances to avoid traffic, and also we did one half the intersection first, and we did that behind concrete barriers. We squeezed everyone over here, and we only flipped it. And that's the type of constructability that we look at for each of the intersections. Okay, uh, gentlemen in the cap. Yes, uh, may I add to, to the construction? Uh, uh, it will impact Imgen Road, Blanco Road. Reservation Road. Uh, yes. 
and that's where the problem is going to be happening. Yeah. In fact, we saw that during the winter time when Davies Road Bridge was closed. You know, most of the traffic was going down Reservation Road. And is there somebody here from the state? Are the no, state uh, familiar with this project? That's right. You're impacting 68, which is Highway 68, uh, which is State Highway. No, yeah. no. When we uh, have, had our have they got the blessing? You got the blessing from the state. So we've been funded by Caltrans to do the study. We have a weekly phone call with uh, my counterpart at Caltrans. All of our concepts have been reviewed before they're released to the public. The whole document's being reviewed right now by Caltrans. They're a hand-in-hand partner. Okay. Just to add to the detour issue, this is some of the things that we dealt with on the Holman Highway project, Lighthouse Corridor, as we talked about. There's there was a lot of concern that it was going to be impacted, and so there's a lot of um, coordination with folks along that corridor and encouraging people to, um, to not drive, to park the way, to park Adjust your schedule. Adjust your schedule. Okay, gentlemen, in the second round. Okay, um, one of the things that I'm really concerned about is bicycle traffic. And I, um, I think a very common route is from San Francisco to Utica Rock. So I wanted to go uh, on that route. I would have to go across high speed lane traffic twice to get um, out of town. And then twice again to get into the road here. So, um, uh, and there's a lot of that, this is a very common type. And I also think that maybe it'd be worth reconsidering having the country road, people the country road and all the way And uh, having a single on the road to serve both the road. There's a much larger area for a lot of the people here for hours. Very nice. So I hope that you will be there. Okay. Um, so I know people are leaving. If you have to leave, I just want to say thank you all very much for coming. We really appreciate it. But we're going to be here for a while. The woman uh, back there. Well, the person right on camera mentioning during the single, the only thing is, I mean, people are going 60 miles per hour on 68.
Villains. Villains have no ability to access the the uh, roundabout of either San Leandro or Corral. They're going to be they're going to be stuck, except maybe having to go right and then and then enter the queue and get off in San Leandro. So if you leave that furniture over there and put a big roundabout or an interchange or call it what you want, but eliminate San the light that that San Leandro, eliminate the Corral light and the lights west of them sink the lights to 218, I think we're going to see a lot, a lot better. Uh, uh, I think it's, a, it's an alternative that's worth considering. And all I've been asking for is what might it cost? What's the cost estimate for this? So Grant, do you want to reply? Yeah, so rough estimate for an interchange is over $25, $30 million. We have fifty million dollars dedicated, and then and then sinking the lights west to two eighteen would be what another eighteen maybe. So it's yeah, and you don't get any of the benefits that we talked about for improving the other intersections. The lights don't have the benefit. There's a little bit of delay savings, but safety emissions, uh, multimodal for cyclists and pedestrians, those aren't there for keeping the lights in. There. <laughs> what I have heard from a couple of speakers is this whole notion of taking a closer look at the San Benancio Corral interaction, and I think that's why we um, mentioned that in our study, looking for more, um, you know, to do more analysis on that, we'll get in the next phase, because they are so close together. Um, it is important to recognize that even though they're really close, there's a bridge, there's a water feature underneath it, and anytime you have that, then um, you have endangered species, I can't remember which one it is. Uh, whether it's the frog or the salamander or all of the above, but it does, uh, it does mean that there's um, uh, challenges in terms of any kind of improvements in that corridor. But we're going to take a closer look at it in the next phase. So this is a, a video like Rich had for his on the I show the uh, Ken and Joe Ray, this is the two intersections close to each other. San Manancio for Alvin here, and this is with the number of cars that are predicting for 2035 in the PM commute, 435, 530. And this is not what's widely out between. So you have a center turn lane for the folks at the villas to get in and out. And then it's a matter of the intersections controlling the flow of traffic mm. and not getting those large plumes that we talked about earlier that happen when people stop and back up. So this is what the model's showing in the flow line. This is what the model showed for Holman Highway. And that's in the United Kingdom and on the continent, you'll have roundabouts that have two and three lanes within the circle. So if you've got traffic coming west uh, on 68 that want to make a left on Corral de Pierre Road, by having a second lane, then it, it prevents the, 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 the semi or the other cars that are trying to get to Monterey it, it doesn't slow them down because the, the car that's trying to get on the corral gets in the left lane and comes up the the air road. I've seen this, I've driven in the United Kingdom and on the continent where these are in place and traffic works fine. And there, these are some pretty high impact areas right around London. Any further questions? Uh, yes? Uh, so, uh, it, it appears that a lot of the, the impetus for this is to aid commuters coming from Salinas and beyond. Mm -hmm. uh, I was under the impression that, and this is for the, the two Tamsi people, I was under the impression that a Tamsi consultant did a study and concluded that with either option one or option two, the average savings in commute time uh, from Salinas to Monterey would be five minutes. Five minutes. I know she didn't have that slide uh, in your presentation. So I guess the question is, you got a lot of environmental damage that's going to be done. You have a lot of construction. You have these issues with whether well, roundabouts are the right solution. So to say five minutes is, I guess the question is, is it worth it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's the same study we're doing here. That was part of the delay study I talked about. And the five minutes is a comparison between the two options. So five minutes 
more is what you would say with the light room than what you would say without the light room. And so that's a comparison between the two. That's all a bit of crystal ball work looking at our computer models and assuming all those things will come true. But the five minutes was to highlight that if you're going to spend another $60 million on lightning, you should save more than five minutes. And so the five minutes was the difference between the two. But also, it's okay, so environmental. Hold, you can hold on, please. Oh, I got a question here. How long should the construction take when it starts so we're going to have something? Every time we have inter intersection work and, and lightning and decaying, it's been an absolute nightmare on the sidewalk. So we're looking at five years, <coughs> years, 15 years of construction nightmare? Well, this gets back to what we're talking about, staging and figuring out how to do it. And it's too early of a stage to give you an answer on that. So what's the best case, what's the worst case? Well, the intersection from the Holland Highway is under a year. And so... so we have yeah, 10 minutes, that's so... You get in a long one, that's one year. 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing it for you and your children and your grandchildren. And like I said, we have the funding source. The individual intersection doesn't take that long. It's how we package them into places. And you know, for Ferndale, we did a four-year-long, $200 million highway upgrade. So we never stopped the highway. That's 80,000 cars a day. And we never had to stop. And that was a staging plan. For this highway roundabout, 30,000 cars, 28,000 cars a day, never stopped. And so, yes, you're going to have construction in there. I can't tell you yet what we're going to phase it like. Could I add a little perspective? Yeah. So, with, with the Holman Highway Roundabout, that's a scenic highway as well. Um, and one of the things we faced very early on was whatever we build there is either going to enhance or erode the character of the modern peninsula. One of the reasons we have the little roads and congestion that we have, and that we're willing to accept, is because it's a beautiful place and we don't want to turn it into San Jose. I used to design freeways. I know how ugly it can look. So, you know, that extra construction time is oftentimes really worth it. Really, really worth it. Because what we have here is rare and it really is in danger. The setting is rare and endangered. So it takes very conscious thought, and you do it right, you don't skip any steps, and be efficient, be smart, and you will we'll find the right balance between how long it takes, how much it costs, and what kind of damage is left over when we're all done. George? Uh, I think you said 20 miles an hour is the standard speed limit in the roundabouts. Is that, is that a, speed? My, well, my question. Oh, no, no, there's no limit. See, my question is: um, on Highway 68, the traffic will probably be at a higher speed between ramps. If you have different speed allowed in different ramps, you're going to have a problem of people remembering which is which because they ignore speed signs after a while if they know at all. All the time. My, my concern is the gentleman back here about uh, in Great Britain about a wider center lane. Right now, you see people who can't who don't know how to merge. They just stop. Yes. It was irritating. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Is there a way to have a wider lane so that in the center lane, so that there is some merge room? Because if it's just a kind of a wider lane, but just a wider one lane, that's not merge room. And then the people who come in who are in it are going to create the same problems that we have just a second merge room. No, you're right. Each roundabout takes on its own culture. And everybody has to get used to it. There is a burning period. It really is six months. And then, even with that culture that's developed, and we get used to driving, you'll still get somebody who doesn't know it's their first time, and that'll be uncomfortable. It's going to be one of those life experiences where we're going to have to be patient, you know, from here on out. But isn't that also true with traffic signals? Yeah, I was just going to say that. There's the one at Boots that I hit every time. There's the one at York that I got rear-ended at, that it always comes up running too fast. You know, there's the one that I never have to stop at. There's the airport, sometimes I make it, sometimes I don't. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it's the same kind of situation, only the penalty for making a mistake is much greater at a signal, because if you 
you're going to rear-end somebody much more easily. And but if somebody makes goes through too late, then someone gets T-bone, which is the most dangerous kind of um, crash. Yes. Yeah. So, sorry yeah. to interrupt. So anyone who's woman back back there. There. Well, we were talking about the five-minute wait, plus or minus. But one has to keep in mind that the environment is going to gain because there won't be that idling. So, okay, it's five minutes better or worse, or, or better or the same. But the environment's going, hopefully, to have benefit whether we get through faster or not. Excellent. Yeah, five minutes times, you know, 30,000 cars a day times 365 days a year times how many years? Yeah, that's also a good point about the environmental impacts. Of the three options, this was the one that was the least constraints are at a small footprint. And so the two of what we were looking at is another benefit for the And nationwide, if I can just jump in nationwide, you know, we're getting average numbers from the Federal Highway of 80% reduction in injury crashes nationwide for roundabouts. So really with lower speed you're calling GEICO instead of the paramedics and you get it. Yeah. Oh, I wish that we were talking about that as well, you know, because of the environmental impact. Because we're, we're dealing with the carbon footprint, and the, you can talk about it all you want, but we can't handle 32,000 cars and all that pollution if you have roundabouts or lights or whatever. I've lived here long enough to see every light we put in just about. There were a couple. And I'm sure there are good, you know, well intentioned people from fancy time. That's why we need every light. And we knew it would cause this much more delay, this much more delay. Are roundabouts the flavor of the month? Because lights were the flavor of the month a decade ago. We needed all the lights then. Now we need all the roundabouts. And I think, you know, we're just not dealing with the problem that's facing us in this environment. And that is we want to be a rural area. We don't want all the cars that we have. We don't want the lights. We don't want the roundabouts. We don't want a freeway. And you know, you can say roundabouts are better than lights, but maybe that's true today. But it's not going to be true for long. It's it's just it's just a band-aid. You know, and maybe not a good one. And maybe you have too many band-aids. And maybe you could look at the um Tier bypass as some as something that could at least help out this very complicated, very close with major intersections. Um. Yeah, I just want to address what you're saying. The fact that we have such an over-congested road is due to decisions by the Board of Supervisors allowing development over the past 30 to 40 years. You can't reverse that. I think this is the best way we can preserve the scenic highway that we have. We're going to get the wildlife corridors. We're going to slow everyone down. It'll be safer. It won't be any faster. And hopefully there'll be no more developments approved. Do you, do you work with Landwatch? <laughs> 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 yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to commend the good people from Nancy for doing a magnificent job from inside of science. You are master of engineering, design, and measurement. So, unfortunately, there are things that happen outside silo which makes your work almost irrelevant. The desertion thing of the swing is not because of the horrendous mismanagement of the ground.
It's not the crazy tunnel project. So, so I want to keep this on transportation. Well, the okay. trick is this is irrelevant. Okay. We so, are we are we are planning. Uh, we are planning. This is a dream. This is Disneyland thing. Okay, so, so reality is we need to shut down the well that was put over here okay. on the, the bank thing. And we need a land watch that really watches the land instead of being the agency yeah. of the Salinas Valley <coughs> uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce, which it is. <coughs> so I got throw something out there just as a response to the last couple of comments. First of all, Debbie, Rich, and I are part of the profession that is optimistic about the plan. We assume the future. So we have that here in optimism. Secondly, yes, <coughs> transportation is almost always playing catch up to land use decisions. Land use was decided some decades ago or some years ago. It was not always included in that decision how to handle the traffic. So we are still playing up, catch up to that across Murray County, across the state, across the country. That's our challenge. But we do have that inherent optimism to go out there every day and try and meet it. Not because we're in a silo, but because it's our job. When okay, this so place is a desert, just, you're just, not going to need me. a highway. Sure. What's, sure. This, uh, what's the status in the decision-making process for Go or No Go? Does this have a green light? Are you still in the neighborhood outreach promotional stand? I mean, is this going forward? Can somebody talk about how, how do we know when this actually gets going? Or is it still in suspense? Sure, so this is a very good time to involve because it's going to a board of directors at the end of the month to be adopted. And that means that our board says the job is completed. This is a plan that we agreed to send to Caltrans. Caltrans owns and operates the highway, and to go. After this stage, we go to work with Caltrans on refining the design and environmental impact, answering all the great questions you guys have given us tonight, but we needed more work to answer. And then after that, it goes into an environmental review stage. And we come back and we talk to you all again. And we have a few alternatives to this one. And you all give us your input again. And when that is concluded, then you have a final environmental impact report. And then you start moving forward with the project. Who pulls the trigger? Jepsy. Jepsy yeah. decides whether to move forward next because we're the funding entity. Um, in our dreams, Caltrans would take a look at this and say, hey, let's go ahead and do this and we'll pay for it. But um, because funding is, is a whole mix of different things, our agency really does become a catalyst as to whether and how it moves forward based on um, what we get in community input, what our technical analysis shows, and how much money we can pull together. So, um, you know, if you want to voice an opinion one way or another, stay connected with Landwatch, make sure you're on our mailing list, stay tuned, and, um, and we'd love to stay in touch with you all throughout this process. So, um, I'm going to take uh, two more questions, and then we'll wrap it up. Everybody's been very generous with their time. I want to thank you all. Two more questions, and then many of us will be hanging out. So, uh, the woman. Yeah, I just wanted to know, have there been any schedules about what goes first? Where will you start? Will you start at Corral? Will you start at San Financio? Will you start further west? Constructing the roundabouts, if this all goes through. You know, when you when we get into the design process, um, the schedule is going to kind of pop out in a couple of different um, options. Mm -hmm. um, some of it is dependent on right away do we have to you know catch a piece of property or not. Utility relocations, gosh, do we got to do whatever. Um, there's stuff like uh, permitting, fish and game. You know, sometimes they won't let you build during certain periods because of it's raptor nesting season or the legless lizard has, you know, prom or whatever it is. And there's restrictions that make it tougher to do certain things at certain times. So the as we put the design package together, those things will pop out, as well as what do we do with traffic during the first stage? I mean, what do you what do you do when you don't have any other else to, place else to put the traffic? 
what do we build first? And those things will start to materialize and then it'll make sense and the choices that will come before you later will be, you know, what do you think? Should we build, you know, everything on that side first? What do we do? And there's most likely going to be some temporary traffic signal work where we shift stuff over to create space. Yeah, so it, it sounds to me like everybody's really eager to know what are we going to do first, and the bottom line is we don't know yet. we got to figure out what we're going to do, and then we'll figure out what we're going to do first. And so we'll keep you all involved in that process. And if you have an opinion on what we should do first, we'd be interested in that. That would be part of the decision making that Rich was talking about, along with other issues. Okay, last question. Okay, I live in Broker, I live in Broker, okay, so my, I guess the school district involved in the funding of this whole thing because there are a lot of people with one child in the car driving an SUV and it backs up Portola and then I also was picketing out there when we were picketing about that your interchange because when you count the vehicles that are coming through our neighborhoods, now our streets, because I back up to a street that they cut now in front of the people on Portola, which is having a real mess there. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, but it's still district involved because there's a timing thing there that could take place too, a little bit, is what I'm thinking. Because everybody's on the road at the same time. How about you, the school bus? No, they don't use their own transit. You know, one of the, the, the only reason why I'm here clearly is to answer questions that are quite related to the technical <laughs> issues here. And this is actually one of them. Um, how do we encourage the schools to have some sort of ride sharing program? Because buses, are not funded anymore. So how do we address? They make you pay to three hundred ninety-eight dollars to put your kid on the bus in this school district. So, um, so what we are launching in the next year or so is a fuller rideshare program. It's kind of been on hiatus for a while, and um, we're going to be targeting employers and we're going to be targeting schools. And in fact, one of the things in Measure X is a safe routes to school program, and part of that is about carpooling is about uh, having kids who <coughs> walk to school, but clearly the impact is for people driving their kids on Highway 16 to school. And so I certainly am going to take back the fact that this is probably a good place to start, is it, it the schools that are accessed in this corridor, because Grant alluded to it and you're all familiar with it, the traffic is much worse during school times of year. How can we help address the demand uh, for the highway during that time of year? by helping make it easier for people to carpool. Yeah, they don't have your car in the summer. They okay, don't. so thank you all very much. Um, many of us will stick around, so if you have other questions, feel free to come up. I want to thank uh, Rich, Grant, and Thank you all very much.